to Comscon Iron Ring Award, Umbrella's PR and Publishing Editor. Thank you for coming along. Today is our fourth um, Comscon. I'd like to start by thanking our sponsors and supporters. Essentia, our headline sponsor, Logan Research, who is our coffee cup partner, and they'll be in the catering area all day to give you your coffee kit. Media Super, the copyright agency who have a stand in the catering area if you'd like to go and have a chat with them. PZ, our competitions partner, and I'd like to acknowledge our event supporters, QT Sydney, Von Winster Solicitors and Attorneys, Unlimited, and Business Prospecting Tool for Source. The world of PR is changing at a rapid pace. Today's conference is about collecting a snapshot of some of the issues, challenges, and opportunities facing this industry. Today, you'll be hearing from a range of PR and communications professionals, including a number of social media influencers and our dedicated influencer, influencer stream, which is a first for Comscom. We'll talk about how the PR and communications industry is changing and evolving, and what PR is now as a discipline. You'll hear exactly how important having a crisis communications plan is, how to create newsworthy content, and just how YNR New Zealand pulled off the PR stunt of the year with the creation of the Macwapa. Agency bosses will be giving advice on how to, how to support staff build their careers, and Chris Savage will be rounding off the day by offering tips on what skills PR practitioners will need in the future. It's going to be a big day, but before we get into it, I'd like to announce that our competitions and promotions partner, Peasy, are giving you and the audience the chance to spin their wheel and win up to $3,000 of credit to use with their friends at Uber, Vinomofo, and Deliveroo. The winner will be announced here in this room, live on stage, before today's final session. The lucky winner will come up here, spin Peasy's big wheel for the chance to take home up to three times $1,000 credits. All you need to do to win is go to the URL on the screen now, easypromo.com and enter your details. There's no catch. Just go to the site and we'll give away the prize today. It's as simple as that. Just go to easypromo.com. And then Tom, Peasy CEO, will be on stage to announce the winner later this afternoon. Before we get started, there are a few other housekeeping keeping items. We do have free Wi-Fi. The password is on the screen. It's also on your conference name badges. There is a bit of confusion. It is all in caps, umbrella 16. That's the password and the login. Uh, we'll be taking questions across the sessions today. We have staff with microphones, so make sure you wait until your microphone comes over and introduce yourself before fire, firing off with your question. If you're tweeting today, the hashtag is comscom. Also, we'll be sending out a feedback survey. It should hit your inbox just after Easter, so please make sure you fill it in and help us make all our other events and comscom better in the future. Moving on, it is finally time to get started today. I'm very pleased to have with us this morning Clarence Mitchell, the spokesperson for the family of Madeleine McCann, who disappeared from her bed in a holiday apart apartment in Portugal in May 2007. Clarence is a journalist by background, working for the BBC for 20 years. He's worked in politics, working as the head of election media monitoring for the Conservative Party during the 2010 UK general election campaign. And before moving into PR, he was the director of the government's media monitoring unit, based with the cabinet office, leading a 30-strong team of information officers advising 10 Downing Street and all the major departments of state on how to best respond to the 24-7 news agenda. It was this role that connected Clarence with the McCann family. In May 2007, he was seconded into the Foreign Office to assist with the McCanns handling the media following the disappearance of their daughter Madeline in Portugal. It's a role he continues to this day. Please welcome Clarence to the stage. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I just flew in yesterday, so if I sound a little, little spaced out at times, I do apologise, but I'll uh, try and stay awake as we go through this. Um, Miranda, thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you to Munro for the invitation in the first place. It's fantastic to be back in Sydney. I haven't been here for nearly 20 years, I'm afraid to say. I'd love to have come back sooner, uh, but I was here last for the BBC when Michael Hutchins died, uh, and I had a, a similar flying visit then uh, to cover his funeral. Um, but it's wonderful to be back. I'm going to try and compress nine years of communications activity into around about 20, 25 minutes. So by, by definition, some of this will be quite top line. Um, and quite brief, but we're very happy to take questions um, afterwards uh, and to go into any areas that uh, I perhaps don't touch on to, to your complete satisfaction. Uh, as I say, it's wonderful to be in front of so many communicators. I feel like I've got a peer audience here, so uh, please don't, don't judge me too harshly. Essentially, 
Madeline, that's the one now world famous picture of her when she was three. She was nearly four, just a few days short of her fourth birthday when she went missing uh, in May, May the 3rd of 2007. You wouldn't believe it, but that's nearly nine years ago. It doesn't feel like it, but it is. Uh, I'm already getting bids from some US networks for interviews with the McCanns for the 10th anniversary next year, uh, which is crazy if you really think about it. Uh, but it was a story that shocked the world, still does, still has the capacity to shock. It still is maintaining traction as a media story across all countries. Here in Australia, we've had aspects of it come towards us as well with various sightings and other cases that have uh, allegedly been involved, excuse me, involved, um, but of course weren't. Uh, but one of my jobs is to deal with exactly that when stories develop. They can develop at the drop of a hat across the world. We had one in Paraguay just last week, uh, which turned out to be nothing again, but it generates an awful lot of media traction around the news cycles. So, as I say, I'll run you through a little bit of, I'm going to try and outline why it became the story it has become, why it is maintaining that degree of traction to this day, my role in, in helping to maintain that and acting as a spokesperson for the family, um, and some of the things that we've done to try and keep the story current. There is a natural media desire to know the outcome, so to a certain extent I have some of the media on our side already, but we still have to be creative. We still have to be intelligent about what we put out there and when we put out there, uh, when we put it out there, because we are, of course, working with law enforcement in Britain primarily, but also still within Portugal as well. So, why did the story catch fire in the way that it did? Well, essentially, it is an exceptional story in the exceptional multi-platform environment that we now all operate and work in on a daily basis. In effect, Madeline really has become the first missing child case to really take on the capacity and power of the internet and of the 24-7 news cycle that we're all operating in. Of course, there have been many other cases. Sadly, there will continue to be many other cases. But Madeline, not least through her own family's efforts in the first case, in the first place, became the, the situation that was able to utilize and capitalize that power that we all have sitting in front of us on the laptop, the PC, or on our smartphone. Why did we get the likes of David Beckham coming in to support us very early on? Why did we get certain newspapers, the News of the World, of course, no longer exists. That's another story. I'll tell you about that separately. We had our own run-in with them. Um, but why were they able to collate a, report, a reward like that? Um, they maintained that was their reward. It wasn't. It was a collection of other offers that they collected. But they put pressure on us a lot of the time because of that. Talk about that separately in questions. It's essentially, Madeline was the classic exception in the internet age. The traditional definition, if you like, of a news story for a journalist is, well, we, we've all heard, heard the hoary old adage, man, a dog bites man isn't news, man bites dog is. Well, it's true. It's an exception to the norm. And the greater the exception, the more exceptional something is, the more people it affects, the bigger the story. And Madeline, as a missing child case, was, of course, a big story in itself. The younger the child, the bigger the story as well. That's why a baby snatch from the maternity ward gets the coverage it does, and why the 18-year-old who has an argument with their parents and goes home, or leaves home by themselves, doesn't get the coverage, sadly. You could argue morally they're just as equal in terms of deserving coverage and help, but I'm afraid we all know the media, we all work with them, we all know their priorities, and they will always go for the youngest case. In this case, Madeline, photogenic child on holiday, we had the core abduction, the mystery of how come she could be taken from her bedroom on that night of May the 3rd. That mystery remains unsolved to this day. We, people that have been close to it, genuinely do not know what's happened. There is no evidence to suggest he has come to physical harm. Mental uh, capacity, mental situation is a different matter, but essentially, Kate and Jerry, the family, and those around them, myself included, will continue to help them until we have this resolved one way or another. And the media, as a result, have a narrative that is constantly running for them. We have the parental nightmare. Everyone who has a child can relate to the situation. Yes, you may have a view. What happened was, was a dreadful crime. There were victims of a crime or that they somehow were allegedly involved. They are not. I state that categorically from the outset. They've been examined by at least four different law enforcement agencies. There was no question of them involved beyond the fact that they took a decision to dine some distance from the uh, apartment on the night with their friends constantly checking. They might, I should add, uh, they could have had, if they'd been able to have a, a professional nanny service, which wasn't available at the time, it wouldn't have checked as frequently as they were checking with their friends. 
That's not me putting a, a brave face on it. They made a mistake. They know that. They accept that. They've been the first to tell you that themselves. But nevertheless, they felt they and their friends were mounting a, a, a definitive checking system, which had worked well all week until we, uh, we of course, the, the billion to one chance of what happened. But again, so parents around the world can immediately relate to that. You have the responsibility debate. I've just touched on it. They split opinion. Some people see them as the victims of a crime, which they are. Others think that well, they were somehow neglectful, they shouldn't have done it that way. That's a perfectly legitimate view to hold, one we don't agree with, but nevertheless, people do take that attitude. There are another, there's another level, who I won't talk about here in public, online, we all have our own online fan clubs, don't we, for various issues, but there is an online presence who have far worse ideas about what may or may not have happened. It's all wrong, it's all vile, and we've had to deal with that quite separately, taking legal action where necessary. And finally, of course, the class issue. These are professionals, they're doctors. This sort of thing shouldn't happen to a middle-class family on holiday in Europe. <laughs> yeah, fortunately, it can, and it did. Um, I, I've had many people saying to me, oh, if, 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 if it was a poor child from a very uh, you know, low socio, lower socioeconomic background, from an inner city area who'd gone missing, it wouldn't have got the coverage. Why does Madeleine get all the coverage it does? Well, that's not our fault. You've got to ask the media why they have focused on this one particular case. The class issue, the, the respectable middle class professionals that it shouldn't happen to was, quote, in brackets, a, a better story for the media than the, the kid from a poorer background who might, in the media's worldview, have been expected to leave home or run away. It's wrong, but this is the reality of the situation I had to deal with on the ground. So, it also then very quickly became a diplomatic crisis. Not only had we those journalistic triggers in play immediately, we had the Portuguese police, and we had leakage from some, some details that came out could only have come from official sources. I am categorically not going to point the finger at anybody here in a public environment, but nevertheless, there were situations where information that was only in the official law enforcement domain began to emerge. Talequal is, is, was a free newspaper, which was one of the first ones to make allegations against the parents about their alleged involvement. So we had the police competence question as well. The Daily Mail was very quickly off the mark with reporters on the ground in Portugal. Why wasn't Scotland Yard brought in immediately? They would have solved this within minutes. Why are these incompetents not doing their job properly? The Portuguese police naturally didn't like that, and it became very nationalistic very quickly. We had quite an antagonistic argument between, and it even filtered down to the Portuguese media. The, the Portuguese media didn't like the British tabloid reporters, and the whole thing became very aggressive very quickly. We had the governmental aspect, of course. As Miranda said, I went out originally as a civil servant for the cabinet office, so I was there as a, a neutral um, to help them with, as part of the consular package, package of consular assistance that is given. If you lose your passport abroad, you can go to your consul, your embassy, and you can get assistance. If, God forbid, you lose a child abroad, you get a massive amount of consular assistance, a complete package. And because of the degree of media response, I mean, we had three to 400 media personnel in private news in Portugal within two days. Because of that, the British Embassy in Lisbon asked for extra assistance from London just to help with the media alone. It's quite apart from the police work and all of the liaison with law enforcement. So I was part of that package that was sent out. So we immediately had governmental relations with government press officers, in effect, me, um, on the ground as well, which was another factor that gave it that emphasis as a big story. We had Portuguese pride and cultural differences. Why do these crazy Brits want to put their children to bed at 7.30 at night? They should be out with us at the table having wine till midnight. That's just, that's just how it is. Uh, you know, and, and a group of doctors and friends who wanted to put their children to bed, they'd actually tried to eat off the site of, the, uh, of where it happened, the, the holiday inn. Um, the, the, for some evenings early on in the holiday, it hadn't worked, the children were fractious, so they decided to eat on campus, but close to their apartments. That was one of the reasons why they were eating in the tapas bar on the night it happened, and then they were mounting this checking system, as I say. So, then, of course, official leakage, I've touched on that already, we had a lot of that later on, uh, particularly around September, about three or four months in, uh, when the, they were given this arguido status, as it's called in Portugal, which technically is, means suspect. It doesn't mean suspect in the sense of a serious crime. You can be issued with a parking ticket and be an arguido. It just means you're a person of interest to in the police inquiry. But again, that very word, arguido, developed its own narrative around it and confirmed the prejudices of many people that weren't, that weren't pleased with what had happened uh, and also gave my job, made my job a lot harder in terms of beginning to shift that perception as we went forward.
And of course we have the forum debate, the multiplier effect of the wonderful joys of the blogosphere. We all blog, I'm sure I'm looking at many, many bloggers here today. Absolutely fine, blogging is a, in fact a fantastic innovation, but in the wrong hands, with people who have a set of preconceived notions and prejudices, it can be just as destructive as sitting in a mainstream newspaper. So we had to deal with that and constant monitoring of that. There are still two or three anti-McCann forums in existence to this day uh, who still um, rail against the situation. Uh, they are all wrong, I might add. So, my job was to assist the family in turmoil. This was after they got back to Rothley in Leicestershire and the, the British Midlands where they lived. Uh, I treated the situation as a journalist would. Uh, it's very easy to say that as a former journalist, but in, in PR, I think if you cover the situation, whether it's a piece of corporate comms, whether it's public affairs, whether it's a piece of branding or marketing exercise, look at it as a journalist would, through journalistic eyes. Answer the questions, pose the questions that the journalist will ask. If you're halfway towards answering those properly, and giving, can, can give a degree of exceptionality to your proposal, whatever it may be, whether it's crisis, whether it's corporate, you are halfway to getting good coverage and to working and developing a good relationship with the journalists. That's what I had to do very quickly. I had to build very rapid relationships with the media on the ground. Uh, I'd worked for the BBC, if anybody has worked for the BBC in the past, or perhaps ABC here, uh, some people thought I was still working for the BBC. They didn't realise I'd left three years earlier. Uh, it was so big, they thought I was out there to cover it for Newsnight. Uh, so I was able to say to them, no, I'm here in a government capacity, but we know each other, so that helped again. Uh, but I also had, had to deal with the local indigenous media, the Portuguese, uh, many of whom were quite resentful of the fact that international media had suddenly flooded in and was giving their resort a bad name in their eyes. Um, they didn't want to share any material. In Portugal, I think if they, if they think the term a pool means something you swim in. They had no idea of sharing material, so part of my job was to overcome that very quickly and to be straight with them. Um, I didn't speak uh, Portuguese or indeed Spanish. Uh, but with an interpreter, I was able to say, essentially, you be straight with me and I'll be straight with you. And that took nearly a week for them to believe that. But I offered them equal access and equal facilities for photo ops and, and uh, uh, chances to talk to the family with police uh, liaison uh, on an equal basis. And that began to assist the, uh, the uh, format and, and the relationships began to build as a result. We had to immediately rebut, balance any inaccurate stories. Initially, they didn't really happen so much. It was very straight reportage. This has happened today. The police are saying this. The police aren't saying that. One of the problems we had over there was Portugal has a law, the law of judicial secrecy, where it's a criminal offence for an officer or anybody connected with a case to talk about it at all. You can't even confirm someone's been arrested. You can't even confirm the time of day, frankly. And that was the official line. So the Germans weren't getting anything on the record. But boy, were they getting stuff off the record. And that was then coming back to the British journalists who wouldn't get confirmation either, and they would run it unchecked, unsourced. It, it, it was madness. We had a story that would appear on Monday saying black was white. On Tuesday, it would appear in the Portuguese press, no source. On Tuesday, it would appear in the British papers, uh, no source. And on Wednesday, it would be re-repeated in Portugal as the illustrious Daily Mail or Daily Express of London has run this. It, it was just a, it was a spin cycle of, it, of insanity at times. So we had to deal with that as best we could with each particular situation. We had to challenge some of the preconceptions. They thought, as I said, there were cultural differences. They couldn't understand why this had happened in terms of the local population as well as the local media. And then there were the, diff me, the differences between the two sets of journalists on the ground as well, which made their own cooperation difficult and our central liaison with them more difficult at times. And of course, at, the, at heart, this was a comms campaign. At times it didn't feel like it, it just felt like daily firefighting, but essentially I had to sit down with Kate and Jerry at different times and say, right, we've got to define our central theme here, we've got to define our core messages, our key messages. You need to stick to them in the interviews that we're doing, I will stick to them in the, in the public communications that I'm, I'm performing. And essentially the focus was always trying to bring it back to finding Madeline. It seems so obvious it shouldn't have to be said, but over there the, the, it became this daily soap opera. Uh, and the actual search for Madeline, the operational side, was somehow lost in the mix very frequently. That was in Berlin when we were there. We had a, an entourage of media with us every stage, pretty much for the first year, every day. So, I had to establish that narrative very quickly. As I said, the family used the internet themselves. John Corner, um, a godparent of Madeline's uh, in Liverpool, uh, he was already pumping out high-definition video material of Madeline from previous birthday parties and family events, even before 
The Portuguese authorities had confirmed that she was missing. There was so much material on Madeleine coming into the BBC central newsroom, into the hub that uh, brings in all the social media, um, the user-generated content, as they like to call it, that the BBC actually had to tell the family to stop sending us this stuff. Who is this girl? We don't even know her. And it was only later that morning that finally, grudgingly, confirmation came out from Portugal that yes, police were looking at this and that the British child had gone missing. So again, it was the harnessing of the capacity that we all have with, internet, with, with access to the internet and the ability to download that became a very quick early factor in why this established traction so quickly. The family in crisis turned to the net, as I say. There was the government liaison I was sent out very early. Then there was this tension between the Portuguese media and the UK media, which uh, I, had to, I had to basically form three or four briefing points. The media, as you know, huts in packs. The writers would be in one cafe. The photographers would be in another cafe. The Portuguese broadcasters would be in another. So I, had, I began and essentially developed a routine of going round each pack every day trying to tell them what was happening. In some cases, there wasn't an awful lot happening, but they were under immense pressure to deliver stories, so I had to say something. But again, it was that sense of contact, because they weren't getting it officially, that helped to build the relationship with me personally. As I said, we had three hunting packs, and in effect, we had the pack on the ground in Privalus. On certain days, there, could have been, there were some time, if you include technicians for the satellite trucks, there were probably two to 300 media people in Privalus alone. So only a very small, coastal resort, and it just overwhelmed them. I mean, the, the, the restaurateurs were happy, but nobody else was. Uh, there was a pack in London who were writing the, the thick pieces, the why, oh, why would you do this with your children? I would never leave children alone. Uh, oh, I lost my daughter in the supermarket for 30 seconds. It became the dinner party subject of choice, and there were lots of thick pieces being written in London, uh, which was also extra pressure, because these would appear, and suddenly then the re news reporters would get pressure to follow them up on the ground, and I would get demand for access to Cape and Jerry, which we had to very carefully control, as I say, at all times in liaison with the police. We also had, sorry, we also had a third pack in Leicestershire, who in some cases were literally trying to go through dustbins uh, at the family homes and friends' homes to look for material they could find on the family. Uh, that's the, the, the less enjoyable side of the British tabloid mentality, I'm afraid. But again, that could all come back, and I would be getting calls not just from reporters in Pride and Loose, but reporters in Leicestershire and, and correspondents and sometimes editors in London. <coughs> we had to challenge the libels as they started later with some of those, those leaks that began to produce very negative stories that just were not true. We knew they were not true. Uh, so we had to challenge those where we, we, we could. We didn't want to go legal immediately because uh, that would have created bad headlines and bad relations as well. Eventually we had to because there were such extreme cases of gross defamation, as you'll see in a minute. But essentially, we had to nicely discuss with journalists on the ground that their particular title was pushing it, and they were really pushing their luck. And they couldn't prove what they were saying, we knew they couldn't prove what they were saying, because one, it wasn't true, but two, also, they were getting it completely unsourced and just repeating rumors in the local media, and most of the British papers eventually did begin to see sense. We had to maintain the momentum throughout all this. As I say, we had to keep bringing it back to the search. It was always about this witness appeal, this sighting, this piece of information, not, you know, has Kate lost weight? Um, is, is, why is Jerry jogging? All of this, the, the, the nonsense, the, the froth around the edges of it that we had to challenge. We, and the anniversary campaigns, every year, of course, the media, is, as we well know, runs on rails. It doesn't feel like it at times, but it does. If there's an anniversary in the diary, in the forward planning diary, that's the story again, it's three years, four years, five years, next year it'll be 10 years if we get that far. So each time that was a, rather than a problem for us, it was an opportunity to capitalize on it by creating something new, something that would keep the story alive, but again, on investigative terms from our side, not just the, the soap opera aspect. Sorry. Uh, age progression, of course. When a child goes missing, sad to say, particularly at that age, they physically change very quickly. Uh, and so we have put out, we have put out two formal age progress images, uh, both of which were very closely done with the police. That was done at the SWAT, the, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, NICMAC, in Washington, uh, did for us in conjunction with the FBI their belief that uh, Madeline would, would have looked like that at the age of six, and that was released uh, on the second anniversary. We weren't sure about the other span, but that was very American. Um, and another one was done three years later uh, for the fifth anniversary of what Madeline would have looked like by nine. But as you can see, whether they're accurate or not, 
the physical features of the famous photograph of Madeline in the red dress, she will have changed immeasurably since then. Um, and again, we had a, one of the problems I had was to convince the papers to run the age progressed images each time. They'd all say, yeah, but no, we've got the real picture of Madeline. Yeah, but she doesn't look like that anymore. But that just didn't seem to sink into the mindset. So to this day, they'll still run the Madeline red dress picture. And it's great that they run it. We're not being ungrateful. But it doesn't help the search. And we still get people saying, I've seen her in the red dress. What, nine years old? You know, <laughs> but it happens, believe me. So, the net. The, we, we established a website for Madeline very quickly. That's still there, still running to this day. Uh, it acted as a portal for information tip-offs, sightings, of psychics who've been, we've had over 3,000 psychic sightings over the years, some of which are completely ridiculous, but some of which are possibly credible, and we have to put all that through the police. It all gets channeled through the website. It acted initially as a portal for fundraising as well, to help with the search in the early stages. Um, and generally, it's a repository of information, and Kate and Jerry always put out an annual message on that. And they also, because they feel very aware that there are many other cases out there that deserve similar coverage, they highlight other cases of missing children on there as well. The International Challenge. This was exa one example of some of the negative coverage we, we got. So, um, so anybody that speaks Portuguese, you will know that says, that says that Jerry is not the biological father of Madeleine. Utter nonsense, and demonstrably can be proven to be the case that he, that it is, he is the father uh, through IVF medical records. But that didn't stop 24 horas. I've got to be polite when I say about 24 horas. It was a uh, Makes the sun look like the Times literary supplement. Um, <laughs> it, it would run this sort of garbage daily, unchallenged. So we had to challenge it. And again, they didn't really like that because nobody had ever really pushed back against this sort of thing. But again, these stories were either made up, literally, or some of them were coming from official sources. So the negatives multiplied rapidly. They were recycled instantly. The joys of the net, again, not only was it a fantastic vehicle for good in looking for Madeline, it became a fantastic vehicle to disseminate complete bile very quickly as well. So it was a double-edged sword, to use a cliche. The volume repetition of these stories established the truth, and journalists who were coming to it cold would have just done a quick Google search, read whatever it was in, in either indigenous media or international, and they, that was the truth in their eyes. It just isn't the case. So we had to keep constantly putting things in context and explaining it. Evening Standard in London, police name accounts as top suspects. What's, what's a top suspect? Middle suspect and bottom suspect? Again, it's hype, it's hyperbole, and all it was was that they were given this Arguido status, which in reality meant that they, if they wanted to, could have a lawyer present with the interviews that were being done. Kate, uh, at one point, was advised, having done four interviews where all the questions were answered, she was advised finally the fifth time with this status not to answer anymore because you've answered it several times already and you don't need to incriminate yourself because it was clear that certain officers were beginning to go down that route without any evidence. Um, but, uh, so she didn't, to this day, it's held against her online, why didn't she answer all these questions in that interview? They never realised that she'd already answered them four times in previous interviews without a lawyer present. Um, the soap opera, it was that, it became a daily soap opera. It developed unchecked, it just rolled on without any balance from us, and that, which is why it was so important I kept trying to uh, offset it as best I could. The reporters were under intense pressure to de de deliver this. I'd have freelancers out there for the Sunday Mirror or the News of the World, in fact, staffers as well in some cases, almost in tears. They'd come up to me at four in the afternoon and say, I need a splash story on Madeline for tomorrow morning's papers. I need it in the next three hours. If I don't get it, I'm gonna be sacked. And I said, well, we're not, we've already told what we're saying today, or we're not saying anything today, I'm sorry, I can't help. That's just, they, they, would, they would be virtually in tears. Not all of them, but one or two. And what, no matter what I said, a story would appear. And if I, if I expressed even mild discontent with something, that became McCann fury. And it became the story the next day. The McCann sort of lambasted this, launched into that. All of it, complete nonsense. But this was the sort of pressure they were under. We had to occasionally threaten legal sanction with some of the denials because some of the allegations were so lurid and so wild that if we didn't, they, it, it would have entered the narrative to the extent that it, we, we wouldn't have been able to claw it back. And the number of sightings that we got from around the world, all of them, well, not but 99.9% .9 of them, well-meaning, but not actually accurate. And psychics who, again, as I said, if they had anything credible in what they told us, it had to be written straight through to the authorities, both in Portugal and in Britain, and still is to this day. 
We have lots of sightings, lots of visions, where Madeline is seen at the helm of a ship in the clouds and she's thinking of her mother and everything's wonderful. And we go, well, thank you very much, but uh, that's no good. But you'd be amazed, some psychics have half a registration plate, they have a seat number of an aircraft where she's on, all that sort of thing. If there's anything that can be checked out and is even vaguely credible, it goes through to the authorities. We've had armed police meet aircraft in Spain in the past because we were told she was sitting with a man with a particular seat number of a particular flight. And of course, the flight existed, and there was a man in the seat and another child, but it wasn't her. Uh, so, you know, all of this, we can't afford to ignore any of it, even this far down the line. The political challenge. Ken and Jerry didn't want to sit on their hands in Portugal. They, didn't, they, they felt that while the work we were doing in terms of the public comms was, was helpful in trying to maintain a track on the story, they wanted to do more. They felt that they should go on a little tour of Europe. So they went around all the places that were either they were associated with from their medical training days, uh, funnily enough, they, they did some medical training in, in New Zealand um, some years before Madeline was born. Um, but we, so we didn't come this far. But we went, we went to um, uh, Brussels, we went to Berlin, we went to, uh, went to Rabat in Morocco, and of course we went to Rome. And they began to campaign for the uh, introduction of the Child Rescue Alert campaign at the European Parliament, and we actually got a parliamentary vote supporting that uh, in, uh, in the first year, which was great. And it helped to keep, again, it was one of the creations that we, they wanted to genuinely achieve it, but it helped us develop the story. We sought the Prime Minister's support uh, when David Cameron was leader of the opposition, and we've met him since. And we also met three Home Secretaries at different points to urge them to help unlock some of the delays that were happening in Portugal. They wanted a full review of all the work that had been done in Portugal to be done by the British police, and ultimately, uh, we've got the Sun on board and News International as a campaign partner for that. And finally, with the, an open letter on the front page, uh, we managed to get the review begun. And that in turn turned into Operation Grange, which is the Scotland Yard inquiry, which is still running to this day. Uh, reduced detective numbers now, but they're focusing on the core leads that they still have. So that was another aspect. My role essentially was to represent the family, as I've been saying, and their interests. I acted as the principal buffer, still do. It's not quite as manic now as it was. It, it, when something happens, it all comes back like a train. Uh, I was there to speak, not just on behalf of them, but on behalf of the wider campaign and the fund that they are, still have. They're keeping money in reserve now so that when the police investigation stops, as it may well do it one day, so far, so far no sign of that. We're very grateful to the Met for the ongoing work. Um, but they may well choose to begin, resume their own private investigative work, which we did run for a while before the British police got involved. I was there to provide, as I say, some degree of strategic comms advice as best I could in the context of the wider investigative campaign that we were running, and to convey those messages as required, such as this is when I was holding, we held various news conferences with the private detectives that we hired, with various leads and potential sightings of people that they wanted follow-ups on. Uh, my online fan club attacks me to this day for trying to impose a, a personally impersonate a police officer, even to the extent that I was wearing a blue shirt. It's ridiculous, but that's the that's the, the world we live in, I'm afraid. Press freedom. There were 108 specimen gross art, articles that were deemed to be grossly defamatory. Those are just the, the specimen examples. There were many more that were only defamatory. Of course, the four express group titles. We managed, to cut a long story short, we managed to get front page apologies from the express group, from Richard Desmond. Uh, because they realised they were on such thin ice by having run completely unsubstant unsubstantiated rumour, and we got four front page apologies across the Daily and Sunday Express and the Star on Sunday and the Daily Star. Uh, we were told later the only people that have ever had front page simultaneous apologies were the Queen and Elton John. Um, so we're an illustrious company in one sense, but it should never have got to that stage. Uh, as a result, Mr Desmond uh, and his lawyers were relieved of nearly a million pounds sterling between them for Ken and Jerry and their friends who were variously liable to various stories. Uh, we also had a settlement out of court with the News of the World over their publication of Kate's diary, which was essentially a handful of A4 pages that she'd written and the police had then seized them. We never saw them again and then suddenly they appeared with very poor mistranslation in the News of the World as her diary, <coughs> world exclusive, complete nonsense. Um, and that was 125 grand lighter as a result. So all of that money went back into the fund. The McCanns, their friends, didn't benefit from a penny of it, even though they could have done it, it was their personal reputation at stake. We put it straight back into the fund to help with the investigation. 
It did set a marker, as I said, we were reluctant to go legal, but in this case we had to, and as a result, the tone, the Brits, certainly in the British media, did calm down, and things have been pretty, I wouldn't say entirely responsible, but they've been a lot better uh, since then over the last few years. We also had to launch action against one particular individual retired solicitor that I won't talk about here, but he decided to create his own Madeline Foundation uh, and publish a lot of defamatory material online about what he thought had happened, again, none of which was true. Managing practicalities, that was us outside the High Court. In terms of the, uh, the messaging, the, court, the settlement was done out of court, but we agreed that we would host a news conference outside the High Court to give it a judicial feel, uh, and that worked very well. Um, my role requires tact, diplomacy, and absolute common sense, and being utterly straight with the media. If you're straight with the media, generally they will be straight with you. Everybody says, a lot of people say, oh, I had the media out to get me. The number of CEOs I've media trained who say, I'm not talking to that publication, I'm not talking to them again, because they're, out. they're not out to get you. They're out to get you if there is something to get. If you're straight with them, they will generally be straight with you. So the more professional journalists will. That's how I treated it. We needed constant, clear, daily positioning statements. Even if it was a simple no comment, there are ways of saying that without saying it. I am available, still am, 24-7. At the height of it, in year one and two, I could hack it up to 300 calls across the 24 hours, across three phones, uh, from around the world. You could almost tell the world was waking up. You would get the calls from the States, you would get the calls from Europe, you would get the calls sometimes from Australia as well. Uh, the last time we had Australian calls was um, the baby's remains were found in the suitcase in South Australia recently. Um, again, instant knee-jerk reaction of new deaths. Oh, could it be Madeline? Not thinking about the practicalities of getting a child from Portugal across to here and the age as well of the remains, it, it, none of it fitted, as the police in, rightly said very quickly. But again, we still get this sort of traffic any time anything happens. Various uh, ITV strands, BBC strands, and Hello campaign in, in Britain we did for the first anniversary. We did Oprah Winfrey, Winfrey in Chicago. Uh, the Americans are very concerned about the story, even though they accept she probably isn't in America. Um, but nevertheless, uh, there's still American traffic there. Uh, we have an ongoing relationship with Crime Watch, which is the major criminal investigative program which works very closely with the Met in Britain. And if the Met want to do something for Operation Grange, they'll use Crime Watch as their vehicle of choice. And Kate and Jerry are very happy to do interviews for that. They tend not to not want to do wider interviews these days because they've done so many. And we have monitoring continuously online of the various fora, fora and flora, uh, flora rather, uh, online, uh, some of which is none too pleasant. Um, again, very briefly, I'll crop through this. We had, at the height of it, over 400 interview bids on the table at any one time. Nothing like that now, of course, but that was the sense of the scale of it. The initial requirements uh, in anniversaries in required substantial rollout across all platforms. As I said, it's a multi-platform environment we're operating in this. It's not a simple case of just talking to one or two papers. We've had to, we had to craft interview opportunities pictures, the age progressed images in conjunction with the relative law enforcement bodies had to be timed so that we could get into the news cycle. The Nipmec image I showed you earlier was timed to work with the Oprah Winfrey team so we got maximum US television exposure. And there was of course daily liaison with not only the family themselves, and Kate and Jerry themselves, but with the financial backers. There had a lot of people come in to offer them support, which was very good, very gratefully received. Uh, their lawyers and the private investigators when they were running. Uh, I'll trot through these again briefly, but I'm way over type for time. So that was the image for Nick Mech, and that's the sort of coverage we got at the time. That was two years in, and all of the British tabloids splashed on it, which we were very grateful for. But in a sense, shows the scale of the appetite. Uh, and then with the fifth anniversary, when she was nine, that got coverage, but they were still insisting on using the red dress image, which sort of defeated the whole point of having an age progressed image in the first place. We had a trip to meet the Pope, the then Pope, Pope Benedict, uh, in just in the first few months, very soon after she went missing, um, partly because we were told, I was told privately, that the Holy Father himself was watching it on television and was concerned. Kate and Jerry are Catholic and were very open about their faith. They would always be seen at the local church, um, they would pray openly, and he was concerned. And once it became clear that he himself was watching this, uh, it helped me open doors through the um, Westminster Cathedral, the Catholic Cathedral in Britain, which we then worked with the Brit British ambassador to the Holy See, and we were able to organize an audience with, with the Pope, which meant a great deal for them uh, in terms of their personal faith and strength that it gave them. I continued to do press release, press launches as and when. That was a particular sighting of a woman in Barcelona. 
a couple of years in that we um, had information from the private investigators with. All of these things have generated hundreds of leads, sadly, all of which have come to nothing, but, but they, they, they were still generating active inquiries. And there was an active poster campaign being run in conjunction with the website. And we have a team of online supporters who help us with the monitoring as well. A number of women who are very concerned about Madeline in America actually help us with the monitoring. And they were able to disseminate this online as well as part of a social media campaign with the various age progression images. That was the Oprah appearance, again, getting coverage in the British tabloids. And we insisted that the campaign materials were always used in the coverage of the wider media. So that hopefully was a cross-platform example of cross-platform work coming to fruition. Uh, similarly, out of the Oprah interview, we had follow-ups, and again, we always insisted on prominent placing of the various phone numbers, email addresses, contact details for anybody that had any information. Kate, as well, has since become an ambassador for Missing People, a British charity that works for a whole host of cases of missing, missing children, uh, and adults indeed as well. Um, and so not only do we insist on cross-platform referencing for Madeline, but Kate is promoting various other schemes, including a domestic child rescue alert on a tech system for Britain, which, as you can see, highlighting a particular school girl there. But Kate's very aware that they've been very fortunate in getting the coverage they have, and that many other cases need similar support, so they'll do what they can. But it's the media. The media still come back to Madeline rather than other cases. Um, uh, certainly she's aware of that, so she does what she can outside of it. And very briefly to finish, ongoing developments. Grange is still continuing. I'm still liaise with the police as and when we get anything of substance that comes in. Uh, I pass through to a particular detective to help them on that. We, every time they do a crime watch or any particular police appeal, not that often these days because the police don't need them to at the moment, but when they do, we get over a thousand pieces of information come in, even this far down the line, nine years old. It's hard to believe, but people come in with, oh, I was there on holiday, I didn't think it was important at the time, I may have seen this vehicle. It all helps. It all helps. The election cycles, as I say, continue. We had a weird one in Paraguay last week. Some guy set himself up taking out local adverts in local papers, claiming he knew where she was. Believe you me, if somebody knows where Madeline is, the first thing, the, the last place you're going to see any news of it is in the local media. That it will be after she's recovered. But this character decided to do it, and he's now being investigated by the police himself. But it's the same, nevertheless, it generates this wave of attention and calls that have to be dealt with and processed. We have legal action continuing against a particular former Portuguese police officer, uh, Mr. Amaral, who wrote a very unpleasant book. Um, alleging, in essence, that Kate and Jerry know what happened and they've, they've covered up the truth since then. It's just not true, it's fundamentally untrue, and therefore ergo defamatory. That's going through the Portuguese courts at the moment, it's a very slow process, um, but that is still ongoing. And again, there is a certain amount of attendant media around that that needs to be controlled and managed. And finally, as I said at the start, next year will be 10 years. It doesn't feel like it, but I'm already getting bids. I had CBS and NBC on to me last week saying, can we do a 10th anniversary interview with Kate Joe? which rather presupposes we won't, still won't know what's happened in, in a year's time. Uh, so one, it's slightly offensive in its own right. And, and, but two, it just shows you the scale of this, and in a way, a sign of the success, if you like, of the campaign so far, that there is still that level of interest. But um, as I say, Kate and Jerry remain incredibly grateful to everybody that supported them all the way through. And in particular, they're very acutely aware of other cases that they want to lend their help to, and they will always do that uh, where they can. They've actually formed quite a few independent relationships with other families who've had similar situations, differing ages of missing people. Um, but uh, they, they've maintained a lot of very strong private uh, relationships and friendships as a result, excuse me, as a result of it. And finally, just to close this part, that's who we're doing it for. That's who we continue to do it for. Madeline is still out there. We genuinely don't know what happened to her on that day. There is nothing to suggest that she was physically harmed, as I say. And on that basis, Kate, Jerry, and myself, everybody involved in it will go on believing that she may still be out there and can be found. Every time that Kate and Jerry, and they're any human like you or I, every time they get a, a moment's doubt in their minds, a lot of people say, well, she must be dead. Why are you bothering? Uh, many people here may think that. I don't, I genuinely don't know. They don't know, and so they say to me, uh, we, we, you know, we, we still need to have hope, but it's hard. And then something like J.C. Lee Dugard happens in the States, the girls in Cleveland, Natasha Campbell, Elizabeth Fretzel, Sean Hornbeck, other cases where people have been held against their will, in some cases, 18 years. Very rare, 
mainly in America, but nevertheless it can happen. So people turn around to me and say, well, actually, I'm not wrong to keep hoping. And they will do. And if it was your child, you'd say the same. Um, so they think it's as logical to keep believing that she might be alive as it is logic illogical to actually think that automatically she must be dead. There's no evidence of that. And so that's why I continue to do what I do. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>
any desire not to have the investor minute piece, but simply because of the daily pressures and the, the deadlines or the constant 24-7 monster that is the web, the blogs, the, the fake pieces and all the rest of it. Um, but uh, it did help if I knew the journalists and they knew me and I said, look, come on, this is, this is the genuine truth of the situation. If you don't run that today, I might be able to help you with something tomorrow. And they were prepared to give me a, a fairer hearing. But it didn't guarantee success in any ways. If there was a problem, as I said before, with CEOs that don't like the media, if they have that attitude and there is a genuine problem with the brand or the product, it's a story. And, and it's not them personally that they're after, it's the brand or the situation. And with us, if there was a problem, with, I mean, some of the stories that came out were so wildly inaccurate, all I had to say was, look, honestly, this genuinely isn't true, and we can prove it if necessary. And that would then send legal into a frenzy, and things wouldn't appear. Any questions from the floor at this point? Yeah. Hi. Just, if you could just wait for the microphone, that would be great. Hi, Nikki Williams from Spin PR in Perth. Um, I've got two questions, if you don't mind. Um, the first one was, when did you feel that it was appropriate to go back to London? So when did you leave Portugal? Mm -hmm. and, this, and how do you tell when the, the appropriate time is? And the second one, um, who's your client? So is it the foundation now, or was it um, the police initially, and did it switch at some point? Yep, no, good questions. Um, to answer the first one, I was out there initially as a civil servant. I was a government representative, and I wasn't there to speak on their behalf. I was there to organise this. If, if you're there at 8.30 this morning, you'll see Kate and Jerry walk past you get your picture. It was logistical. And I was there for two months or so, just over two months. Uh, and then I was brought back to London because of cost, uh, because, in fact, there were questions we raised in the British Parliament about why is this one family getting such a degree of uh, attention and support. Uh, it was simply because of the media response. It, you know, it was phenomenal. There were three or four hundred people on the ground, so I had... It was, wasn't just me as well, there were one or two others from the Cabinet Office that were there to help as well. But I was brought back. But then when they had this sort of Guido status put on them by the Portuguese authorities, um, I wasn't even allowed to talk to them. And why should I? As a, as a government representative, I wouldn't talk to uh, somebody who's technically a suspect in a foreign jurisdiction. Um, it was only when they got back in September that they then, a number of wealthy backers had offered their support, people who didn't know them, um, including Richard Branson, J.K. Rowling, and one or two others. Uh, and a gentleman called Brian Kennedy in the northwest of England, multi-millionaire, very kindly said to them, who do you want to do your PR? And they said, oh, we like Clarence, can you come back? I put the notes to me. And the next he said, right, I'll pay your salary. So I then resigned the government job and joined them full time in September um, on his payroll. I was his director of comms for his chain of home improvement ventures, actually. Um, it was quite bizarre at times. I would get calls where we're watching some new website for a bathroom. Saying, yeah, I can help, but not today. Um, and so I was so, so to answer the question, who was my client? Technically, it, it was them and their fund, which was able to pay, or him as the backer, who was able to pay me. And then through, uh, you should always say that the PR should never become a story, and that's absolutely right. But given the sheer focus of attention on this, for a while, I certainly became a face of the story. And as a result, other, one or two other agencies in London, Freud's and Bursa Mostella and Lewis PR, all, all offered me um, consultancy roles. So I then, that's how I moved into PR, and I set my own company up just late last year. Should have done it years ago, but uh, essentially that's what I've been doing. Any other questions from the floor? Yeah. Hi, Clarence. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I'm Asha from Fox Sports. I've got a couple of questions. Um, firstly, when you were shaping your message or your response or your comment, I could imagine for this case you had so many people inputting um, their ideas and what stance you should take. Is there a sense check that you, um, or a method that you follow to, I guess, back yourself that what you're saying is the right approach in such a sensitive situation? Um, Secondly, when you're dealing with the media, did you offer any exclusives or, um, or was it kind of just all in and you gave everything out to everyone fairly or did you work with certain channels, media, um, separately? And lastly, um, celebrity input and support, did you approach them or did they come to you? Um, how did that kind of happen? Okay, that's, that's three questions and I'll try and answer them uh, as best I can. Uh, first one about messaging and, and to decide the sensitivity of it. 
it was the same principle as meeting the client for the first pitch meeting, really, it was, uh, and, and the informal uh, chemistry meeting. I sat down, with, I, I flew back to Portugal with Jerry, who'd come back to Britain. Uh, I first met him in the UK. He came back to collect some more of Madeline's belongings because they needed more DNA um, for, for, for the initial tests um, uh, on the bedroom. And I then met Kate when I went back with him to Portugal. I didn't know them at all. A lot of people assume I knew them as, as a family friends. No, I didn't know them until that day. We sat down and I just said to them, look, this is going to be hard. You're in the middle of this god-awful situation, but I effectively, I'm a journalist in front of you now, and I'm going to get asked this question, this question, this question, and this question, and this question, and I'm going to need answers for all of them. We don't want to do that. We don't like the media. Well, you're going to have to do this. You've got them literally outside the front door. And so we sat down and began a long, slow process of one, me getting to know them on a personal level, but two, then developing answers that they were content with. They felt that all of it was intrusive, and it was, but we know the world we operate in. Uh, and so we did, we, the basic core theme of whatever message we structured on the day, you know, it might be around a particular story that appeared, but essentially it was always about trying to bring the focus back to the search for Madeline. It seems screaming and obvious, but it wasn't at the time. It was very easy to just react to that day's headline in that particular paper. And, and then it would become McCann Fury, as I say, and it would roll off. We had to try and bring it back each time to the central message. So if there was a police line, and there were precious few in the early days because the Portuguese weren't saying anything, but eventually, in fact, frankly, whenever our own private investigations began, it got a lot easier because we then had genuine things we needed to convey. But it was simply or always about trying to keep the message on track, about bringing the focus back to Madeline being missing and the search for her, not the wider family soap opera that was developing around it as part of it. Um, your second question was, give me... Uh, was, yeah, so did you work with anyone exclusively or was it just... Yeah, yeah. Uh, I didn't go exclusive at all because that would have backfired very spectacularly, very early, very early on. And also, we could, we could not claim to want the public support as widely as possible if I was only going to talk to one or two papers. And excuse my language, you're going to piss most of the other papers off very quickly if you go exclusive on one line or two. They were offering us, oh, give us this and we'll donate X thousand to the fund, give us that. And so that we're very grateful, but you're not getting it exclusive. And they all wanted the story so desperately in those early stages that they were happy to go along with that. Later on, as the, as the appetite began to wane on a daily basis, we needed to be a bit more imaginative. And so, as I said, the Oprah thing was an example of that. That was done as a US television exclusive because it was Oprah, and it enabled us to have that platform. And that in itself opened doors into print and online. But as a, as a general principle, we didn't go exclusive, exclusive, and I still don't. And the police never want that. If the, if the police turn around and say, can you do this interview, can you do that program, we make it available with um, you know, pre-clips and press releases and all the rest of it to make it as widely available as possible, even though it may be carried on one particular title. Exclusive is fine for a one-off story, but for something that's running where you need public support, you need everybody on board. Sorry, there was a third question. Yeah, celebrity. Um, celebrities, uh, again, the support we have was fantastically, gratefully received. Some of them immediately, with the sheer weight of coverage, contacted us, which makes life a lot easier, I freely admit that. And don't forget, I didn't come on board for at least nearly just over a fortnight after she went missing. It took time for me to be sent from London. A lot of people assume I was there virtually when it happened. I didn't. There were a number of other press officers and various other agencies involved supporting Mark Warren at the holiday resort as well. Uh, rather than family per se. Um, so when I got there, a number of celebrities had already offered their support, such as David Beckham. Um, Richard Branson was very kind. He basically offered any travel that they needed anywhere. Uh, Philip Green from Topshop, he offered his jet. And I initially said to them, this is great, it's useful if we're going to go anywhere, but we ain't going to start getting associated with celebrities because then it becomes the circus that I'm trying to avoid it, nor did they want to. So we very politely, pretty firmly said, thank you for the offer. If we need it, we will take you up, but not now. And it was only when we were finally told on a Monday evening that we needed to be in Rome on Wednesday morning uh, to meet the Pope um, that I finally had to call Philip Green. And he was immensely kind and moved the plane from Britain to Faro so we could fly direct to Rome. We checked out. We didn't want to do it because of the impression it would give. You know, they were saying, we're not anybody special. We're just a normal family. Why should we get this help? But we checked out the commercial flights, and it would have meant a zigzag across Europe, and we would have got monstered by crews at every airport terminal. 
So we thought, so we'll go with this time. So we, Philip was very kind and offered us that. That's the one time we took up the celebrity assistance. Um, so it was a degree of them coming to us and then us using it intelligently when, it, when we needed it. Do we have time for one more question? I think it's that one. Hi, my name is Francis. I'm wondering how you manage the on the record versus off the record. So in my experience, you've got the legal reality and then the media reality. So, you know, we know... Can we move on to the same thing? <laughs> You know, we know that if you can't sort of give them that background or that, that off the record and they don't have a full picture, they'll make it up. Or So I'm just wondering how you manage that. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me again, it's a good question. Uh, there is, if I give you the first page of a media training manual, there is no such thing as off the record mm -hmm. anymore. If you don't want to see it, see it in print or on air, don't say it in the first place. <coughs> Uh, so, and again, there's confusion as well. Off the record, unattributable, background, deep background, what does it actually mean? Don't get into that. So what I would say to them was, essentially everything I tell you today is on the record, but I ain't gonna tell you much at all. I would ask your understanding, and certainly with the British journalists who I knew, it was easier, as always goes back to the strength of relationships. I would say, look, come on, we know that we can't get into that today. And, and that just isn't the case. I can't tell you why now, but it'll become clear tomorrow or on Thursday. Or if you if you don't run that today, I'm promising you, you'll have something better for Friday. Well, yeah, because remember, remember, we couldn't just say anything. We were having to liaise with the British police as well as the Portuguese authorities in the early days, and then later with just the British police. Um, you had to develop a degree of trust, and I could operate better. With, it's against what I mean about knowing the Germans. Those I knew, it generally largely worked well with. With the Portuguese media, who I didn't know from Adam, um, I, I just had to be very, very careful about saying absolutely and limiting myself to absolutely what I needed to say and being open with them as well. They were utterly amazed that a press spokesman, a British press spokesman, would help them with access. When we went to see the Pope, first of all, we wouldn't get, Philip Green didn't want us to take any journalists with us. I said, Philip, there's no point in going to Rome unless we have our own press pack with us. Okay. So he, finally we got a group of them and I made sure that the Portuguese, Lusa, the Portuguese news agency was invited, plus a Portuguese photographer, plus one of their type, even though we had various run-ins with them. Didn't matter. They were bigger and more influential in the wider public battle for public opinion than my upset about a particular story last week. So we got them on board and they sat their open mouth because they thought we weren't going to invite them. When I said, no, you be straight with us be straight, and we'll be, you'll be, we'll be straight with you. And generally, Gradually, it began to change, shift the, the dial and things began to improve. I think that's all we have time for, so please thank, join me in the